This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. Do not be afraid. We are now in control of what you hear. One, two, three, testing. A journey to the far reaches of knowledge and the unknown. I can't believe I just saw that. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups. One soul and preeminent power. From extraterrestrials to exposing the truth. I'll try to explain as much as I can. You're listening to Planet X. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X. This is the Planet X Network. And stay tuned for the Ben Emlyn Jones Show. It's coming up next. And welcome, welcome to the Ben Emlyn Jones Show on Planet X Radio. Tune in for all the latest news, views and reviews from the world of government cover-ups, ghosts, UFOs, hospital porters, paranormal investigation, hidden knowledge, forbidden history and archaeology, chemtrails and more hospital porters. The date is Wednesday the 11th of September and the time is 8pm. I am Jeff Rents without the hair. I am Art Bell without the cigarette. Stay where you're sitting and do not touch your dials. The Ben Emlyn Joe Show is coming, ready or not. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups, this is Planet X. Well, this is Programme 5 of the Ben Emlyn Jones Show on Planet X Live. And um, as you will probably have noticed at the beginning of this programme just now, when I mentioned the date, it is indeed the 11th of September. It is 12 years ago to the day that... Um, Two buildings collapsed in New York, or or three buildings. Did I say two buildings? Oh yes, there was a third one, wasn't there? Building seven. Building seven. What happened to Building Seven? Um, yes, even I forgot that for a minute. Yeah, a third building collapsed, or well, turned to dust, or in some way it disassembled itself in whatever way by whatever means. Um, it apparently did. The uh, Salomon Brothers Building, World Trade Trade Center Five, also collapsed even though it had not been hit by any aircraft the two buildings that had been hit by aircraft collapsed apparently due to the fact that the uh, jet fuel in the planes although a very little of it was was actually available started a fire and weakened the structure and the structure called the building to um well people say collapse i say pulverize turn to dust as uh, Dr. Judy Wood has explained, it, she doesn't think it was explosive. Other, other people have explained this as explosive, explosives. One thing's for certain, though. It wasn't the planes hitting the building in fire. Let's not forget that. I'm sure most people listening to this program understand that. That same day, another object, it may be an aircraft, maybe a missile, I've not made my mind up yet, struck the Pentagon. Whatever it was, it caused an enormous amount of damage, killed a large number of people. And um, again, there was some pretty horrific damage there. It was all blamed, of course, on uh, a CIA agent called Osama bin Laden. And uh, we had to go get him, go into Afghanistan and get him. Of course, they didn't get him because he was dead already. Um, or at least, yeah, he actually, uh, he was, I don't think he was, he was in Egypt at the time, I believe, and he died there. Um, but he was dying when uh, they sent in the, the, the troops who were already there in they were actually in oman on exercises or somewhere in that region and um strangely enough although they were on desert exercises they packed a warm into jackets and white snow suits hmm. that'll come in handy in the burning deserts of arabia won't they yeah and um well suddenly enough people have forgotten about bin laden now well they, they forgot about him soon after and um <clears throat> And of course, uh, he never he, only, he never surfaced again until apparently he was killed about two years ago <laughs> for the third about three times he was reported dead. Actually, that's quite remarkable, isn't it? Anyway, um, <clears throat> I'm quite surprised looking through the news. There doesn't seem to be any mention of it. It has been forgotten, it seems. 
There's nothing on the front pages marking this 12th anniversary. There's a big do for the decade. But really, I'm looking at the um, looking at the front pages. No, nothing at all. Although I'm sure there are people in New York and in other places carrying out you know, church services and memorials for the people who... Um, for the people who did die that day. I think more attention seems to be focused at the moment on um, not so much the past as the future, it's fears of the future, what's going on at the moment. We have um, Barack Obama here and John Kerry beating the war drums at the moment. Um, Barack Obama has just actually released an announcement saying, he has put military action against Syria on hold and I vow to pursue diplomacy to remove that regime's chemical weapons. Apparently, um, Damascus has admitted for the first time that it has chemical weapons. This is, uh, well, I mean, it's perfectly possible that they did have them, probably because they were sold by the U.S. Armed Services, Armed Services Committee, which um, was the same people who sold Saddam Hussein his chemical weapons as well. Um, there's been some; they've done some deal with the Russians now, which means they're going to hand over their arsenal, um, and the Americans have put their attack on hold. Now I wonder why there's a sudden change of events, I don't know yet, but um, Steve Rosenberg for the BBC in Moscow says Russia seems to have kept one ste step ahead of the US while President Obama has been accused of U-turns and zigzags, of drawing red lines and being slow to act on them. President Putin has been as solid and unshakable as the Kremlin walls, consistently opposed to a US strike, the Kremlin's not for turning. What's more, Russia believes that its message has been getting through and its tough stance has helped dilute international support for US military action. Last week the UN and the EU and the Vatican all expressed their support for a political solution. Even if the Russian initiative eventually unravels, Moscow can still argue that at least it tried to find a peaceful solution. Now, um, I know that Tony Topping actually covered this on his um, Out of the Matrix show um, the other night on Planet X Radio. Um, in more detail, I do encourage listeners to go to the YouTube channel, um, Planet Extra. Planet. Apologies, that is the Breaking the Matrix show with Tony Topping, where he talks about this in detail. Go to Planet Extra 105 on YouTube, where all the podcasts of all the shows on Planet X are available. Now, um, rather strange situation here. Um, the question is now, what's what's happening? How has um it could be that uh Bashar al-Assad has caved in and he may well have made up this story about chemical weapons it's possible he did have chemical weapons um there's no evidence at all as I, I was explaining before when I say it's possible he had chemical weapons it's because he probably I mean I don't know the details of this but I mean there's a photo of him sitting opposite John Kerry having a sort of cozy business lunch with their respective wives I think and um as someone pointed out, I think, in the Facebook group, and this is like history repeating itself, because in 1983, Donald Rumsfeld shook the hands, the blood-soaked hand of Saddam Hussein. And there's a famous photo showing that particular meeting as well. So indeed, history repeats itself. The question is, did Bashar al-Assad carry out this chemical attack the other week, which has sparked off all this trouble? Um, I personally see no evidence to say that. Um, he's admitted that he has chemical weapons. He's not admitted that he carried out that attack. He at the time blamed the rebels for carrying out the attack. The rebels blamed him. So they're both pointing fingers at each other and saying, he started it. No, he started it. No, he started it. No, he started it. Um, as, as I explained in a previous show, the only actual documentary evidence of where this chemical weapons attack seems to have come from is from a contact in the land of Qatar, which is um, in the Middle East where there's a company based there called Britam Defence and that Britam Defence organised a shipment of, chemi of sarin chemical shells from Russia and also Ukrainian mercenaries so they not only intended to bring chemical we weapons into the country they wanted somebody to, to actually use them who they controlled so um, according to um, their contact in Qatar this was with the approval of Washington as I said in the previous show, Britain Defence probably got straight on the phone to Washington and checked with him, and uh, they must have confirmed that. So, the situation in Syria at the moment um, could go either way. We have a, like a breathing space. What happens next depends on how keen the manipulators of this situation are to actually start a war in Syria, a full 
full-blown war. Now, there's several different reasons why they might insist on a war and not a diplomatic solution. It's Some of it might be... It might be a psycho for psychological attacks on people. A war is always much more of a psychological impact than just sanctions or a diplomatic solution, you know, or you know, things like that. Um, but there's also maybe on a high. This is a big subject, too big to go into today. But there may be um, there may be an element of kind of um, have uh, demonology, and that's a like I said, I. Um, I don't know how to describe that in any detail now. I may go into it in more detail in a future show, but it concerns the, um, the creation of horror and pain and death for dark black magic means. Either way, if, if military action against Syria is an essential part of the agenda of whoever's manipulating this situation, then we will see more persuasion. Reasons will be given to us to continue with a military solution to this problem um, you might see as I said before you may see attacks more chemical warfare attacks you may see um, um, bombs in various embassies like the US embassy maybe the British embassy attacks on warships attacks on merchant ships the kidnapping and um, killing of, of travelers from, from Britain and America who knows? It, only time will tell. I mean, this is a new development. It's only just really come about. We will see, but I will keep you posted. If anything happens, you will hear it first on the Ben Emlyn Jones Show. Get in touch with Planet X. Call, text, email. Find us on Facebook. Right, now we have a sort of um, a, a bit of good news on top of the bad news. Um, a bit of an update on a previous story, which I talked about in a previous show. Um, bedroom tax. Um, the United Nations has sent a special rapporteur on housing called Raquel Rolnick to Britain to travel the country talking to various tenants who are affected by this shake-up. Now, um, she's basically been going around making a lot of noise, you know, basically saying that the UK has voiced its commitment to human rights on repeated occasions and this mission will give me an opportunity to assess in, assess in depth to what extent adequate housing as one central aspect of the right to an adequate standard of living is at the core of this commitment. The UK faces a unique moment when the challenge to promote and protect the rights to adequate housing for all is on the agenda. And what's happened is the government really don't like it um, because basically this, the United Nations have sent her independently as an independent um, expert. She's just come into the country privately. She's not, they've not negotiated, negotiated in any way with the government, the Conservative protest over the over the bedroom tax report, because apparently a Conservative chairman called Grant Schnapps has sorry, Gr Grant Schnapps. That's Grant Schnapps is probably what he drinks when he's in Parliament secretly. He's got a little bottle in his jacket. Conservative chairman Grant Schnapps has condemned as an absolute disgrace a UN official's critical comments on the government's housing benefit changes. Mr. Schnapps has said that he would be writing to the United Nations Secretary General to protest. He claimed that the UN official, Raquel Rolnick, failed to meet any ministers or officials, was biased, and has wrongly called the spare room subsidy policy the bedroom tax. Well, Ms. Rolnick is calling it what everyone else does. The spare room subsidy policy is a kind of Orwellian euphemism that the government have given it. Remember the poll tax, they always insisted on calling it the community charge. The community charge. No, it's not. It's the poll tax. Well, guess what? Mrs. Rolnick has said that her recommendation is for this policy to be suspended. She rejected most of the criticisms made by Mr. Shapps, although did apologise for referring to the policy as the bedroom tax. Telling the BBC it was because what everyone around here has been calling it since I got here. Yes, exactly, like I said. So um, this is very, very interesting. The, the United Nations, you know, well, they're still thinking about whether or not to, 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 to um, draft a resolution against Syria, have condemned, or have uh, their report has condemned, Great Britain, our country, <clears throat> for um, this bedroom tax. Now, I, I said on a previous show exactly what I thought of the bedroom tax, about how awful it was, how it's going to strip people, vast, strip some of the poorest people in the country a vast amount of money for no fault of their own, simply because they are in inadequate housing. And when I say, see, 
the word inadequate housing doesn't just mean housing that's not good enough. It means, it means, for instance, you're you're living on your own in like a three bedroomed house, and you may well and you, you may well go to your your council and ask them to put you into a smaller flat and say, I don't need this big house anymore. My family have left home. You know, can you put me into a smaller flat? And they'll say, So we don't have any single room flats available right now. I say, okay, well, you'll have to stay where you are for the time being. You say, okay, I'll, I'll stay here, no problem. And then, later, then they come along and slap a really damn bedroom tax on you because they can't rehouse you. That's basically what this is about. And and she, and she Miss Rolnick actually said, she said she'd received hundreds of testimonies and said there was a danger of a retrogression in the right to adequate housing in the UK. She cited examples of disabled people or grandmothers who were carers and said the measure seemed to have been designed without the human component in mind. Well, duh. Our government doesn't do human components, Miss Rolnick. You should know that already. Um, she said her recommendation was that it be suspended to allow time to better assess the human rights implications and so it could be redesigned. Well, this is excellent news. I think um, everyone listening to this will be delighted. I've had um, I've had lots of opinions sent me. People have spoken to me and written to me about the bedroom tax, and it is universally condemned by almost everybody I can think of. So thank you very much. That's, that's good news. Good news indeed. From extraterrestrials to exposing the truth, this is Planet X. Right, there has been a major event this week. Um, concerning a great historical mystery. What well, I think is a great historical mystery anyway. Uh, most other people don't. I do. Um, it, con it concerns the death of Adolf Hitler. The last living witness to the official story of Adolf Hitler's death has died. <coughs> His name was Rochus Misch and he was an SS soldier and one of Hitler's inner circle of bodyguards and he was in the bunker where Hitler and his, his, girl his girlfriend who he just married, Ava Brown, committed suicide just before this bunker was captured by the Red Army which had just invaded Berlin. All his life Misch maintained that on that day he saw he saw what happened and it, it was in line with the official story. I'll just outline the official story for people who, who may not know. What happened was the war was all but over and well it was over basically the Red Army had invaded Berlin and were closing in on the bunker to finish off Hitler. It, this, it was the 30th of April 1945 and um, basically about half past two Adolf Hitler went into his office with Ava Brown and their dog and um, three gunshots were heard he shot the dog he shot Brown and then he shot himself after that um, the ver his various lieutenants and secretaries took the body outside and tried to burn it with petrol they poured petrol on it and tried to burn it um, now, um, Misch maintained that he saw everything that happened. He, he, he saw Hitler go into the office, he heard the gunshots, he went and he saw Hitler lying there dead with this gunshot wound to his head, <clears throat> and then he saw everyone take the body outside and try to burn it before the, uh, before the Soviet army got there. Now, um, he, as I said, he, he did an interview just recently, just before he died, where he maintained this, he just repeated this again. The truth of the matter is, if this was a completely politically neutral situation um, and the police were involved, for instance, they'd be asking a lot more questions. But it wasn't politically neutral. This was a major event in, 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 in the final victory in the war in Europe. Um, Hitler's body was filmed and it was shown on newsreels all over the world. Footage of the bunker, close-ups of this body that was supposedly Hitler's. And everyone said, phew, we've got him, it's over. The war is over. There were huge celebrations. With the end of the war in London, you know, party the people were partying for four days in London. It was just um, the truth of the matter is, it, because of all this emotion, I suppose it wasn't possible, and also because of a lot of dodgy dealings as well. The truth of the matter is, the evidence for Hitler's death that day in that location is far from conclusive. It was only many, many years later. In fact, it was in 1990 after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the files became available that. The uh, the actual Soviets took uh, dental impressions of the body they found and they compared it with Hitler's own dental records and they didn't match. Which means the body that was shown on the newsreels was not Adolf Hitler. Secondly, when they interviewed the, the, the witnesses, including Misch and all the others, there were at least there were several dozen people in the bunker at the time. 
none of their stories match. None of them are straight. They all there's lots of discrepancies between what they saw. And now, in police terms, that means that they're making it up. There's a lot. They are lying. They are make, they're making a lot of it up. There's been several books written about this. David Hatcher Childress has covered it. And most recently, Jared Williams and Simon Dunstan have written a book called Grey Wolf, and they've got a movie out as well. I know Jared Williams. I've spoken to him. He's got some interviews online as well. It's well worth hearing. He says that Adolf Hitler escaped. He managed to get away. And it was actually, to be honest, there, Hitler had the means to escape. <clears throat> he certainly did. He... The SS had a whole airfield full of captured Allied aircraft. It would be very, very easy to get on board one of those and fly out to one of the harbours that was still in Nazi hands, where he could get on board a submarine which would take him to wherever he wanted in the world. And this is what basically Williams and, Dun and um, Dunstan say, and so did David Hatcher Childress. Um, there's, there's several intriguing clues. That is that when Hitler supposedly killed himself, he appointed a successor, the second Fuhrer. And that man was, it could have been anyone, it could have been all his most trusted friends, his most trusted colleagues, but instead he chose one of his officials whose loyalty to the Nazis was questionable. He chose a man called Admiral Karl Dernitz, who was head of the U-boats, the submarine force. Why would he choose a man who was not part of his inner circle to lead the Third Reich? The reason is that Dönitz, being head of the submarine force, would be the ideal person to organise Hitler's evacuation, to get him out of Berlin, Berlin, to get him out of occupied Germany, get him out of Europe, to safety. Now, uh, it's, without going into too much detail, basically Hitler, according to Williams and Dunstan and Childress as well, Hitler ended up in Argentina and he lived out the rest of his days quite happily there. The Argentine government covered up for him, and they, they gave him they gave him political asylum. They also gave him a false identity. Um, there's a photograph, allegedly, of Adolf Hitler, which, which is bearing very striking resemblance to his earlier, most famous photographs. That was taken in 1962, shortly before he died, and it shows him alive and well. All that time later. Now, there's something that I think. Um, there's one part of this that uh, Williams and Dunstan don't go into, and I think um, I, I think I'm willing to go into. It's a big subject, but it's to do with Allied collusion in Hitler's escape. It seems hard to believe that the world's most wanted man and principal war criminal of the Nazi regime should evade justice. So you know, to should evade justice for so long, and no one even when you consider that you know they they track down all kinds of people. The the CIA and people, you know, they can, they can track down some guy living in in the back streets of London and shoot him. Couldn't they get hold of Hitler? Oh, it's it's perfectly possible that the Allies colluded in Hitler's escape. They may have done a deal with him so that he got out. Um, you must realise, you see, that <clears throat> I mean, whenever wars are fought in this in this world, and this this applies to the Syria crisis in the modern world as much as it does to World War Two and wars before then, the the leaders of the two sides they they act very differently in public than they do in private. In public, they denounce each other as evil, as the Antichrist, you know, chemical weapons bombers, and you know, all kinds of things, all kinds of things they call call them right. In private, they do secret deals. They act like good friends, and in fact, um. Adolf Hitler and, and the Nazi Germany was not some rogue state that just dropped out the sky. It was the darling boy of the West. Hitler's Germany was funded by Western financiers and supported by Western politicians. Before the war broke out, Winston Churchill himself wrote a book called Great Statesman, in which he praises Adolf Hitler as a, as a wonderful man. One of his favourite, his favourite, his second favourite politician in the world after Mus Benito Mussolini. So, it was only then when war broke out suddenly. Winston Churchill became this brave war leader who will fight them on the beaches and fight them in the streets and never surrender against the Nazi hordes. It's, a, it's all lies. So it's perfectly possible that Hitler, you know, in secret he was good mates with all all these people, the leaders of the who he'd been fighting against. They probably said, Look, Adolf, come here. Slick, go out this way. You'll be fine. We won't say a word. We'll turn a blind eye. Of course, it's, of course they, obviously, you'd, you'd think that they'd be up in arms about Hitler's human rights record, which has a lot to be desired, of course, but then you've got to realise is that they don't care about human rights records. They didn't care about Saddam Hussein and his human rights record. 
They didn't care. They don't care about anyone. What they'll do, what they care about, is what's good for business. And Hitler was good for business, so they supported him. In a future show, I'm going to have to tell you a little bit more about what I found out, because I myself have um, got. I was contacted by a man who told me that Hitler didn't stay in Argentina. He went to Antarctica. That's a big, big subject, and I'll have to save that for another show. But I'll tell you what. That's something I really need to get into. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X, the biggest paranormal show on radio. Okay, right, I would like everybody listening to this programme to be very serious for a few minutes. If you don't mind, thank you. Right, I, um... I've been reading a lot of books by UFO skeptics, and um, so I decided I would dispatch the following letter to the mayor of Stratford upon Avon, which is a town in Warwickshire, England, which is famous for being the birthplace of the great playwright William Shakespeare. Dear Mr. Mayor, during my recent visit to Stratford upon Avon, I came across a number of establishments relating to one William Shakespeare. For example, the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, the Shakespeareans, and the Shakespeare Hotel. There were also a number of retail outlets selling everything from leather-bound Romeo and Juliet scripts, scripts to glow-in-the-dark Hamlet skulls. In this way, I am afraid I was forced to make the same observation that several visitors have made to another very similar location. In this case, a city called Roswell in New Mexico, in the United States of America. In fact, I am writing to suggest that Stratford-upon-Avon be twinned with Roswell. Roswell, New Mexico is famous because in July of 1947, there was a highly secretive military operation nearby that is reported to be the response to the presence of an artefact from an extraterrestrial civilization. This artefact, <clears throat> some kind of aerial vehicle or spacecraft, crashed to the ground near Roswell around the 4th of July. The US government responded by sealing off the location of the crash and secretly salvaging the wreckage and also the bodies of the beings piloting the craft. They then maint maintained the illusion that such an event never occurred, something they still do to the present day. Of course, this interpretation is highly disputed, but I found that the chapters of history are rarely untouched by any and all revisionism. Since then, the city has become a tourist attraction for UFO enthusiasts in the same way that Stratford has for Shakespeare fans, with souvenir shops, live shows, conferences and other facilities. Some of the visitors have noted with derision the, quote, model aliens and flying saucers, unquote, the UFO books and other items on sale, brackets, Pilkington 2010 and Wallace 2005, close brackets. They see it as crude, mercenary and avaricious. They dislike the way innocent tourists are asked to part with their money, simply over a famous incident that took place near the town over 65 years ago. <clears throat> Personally, I wholeheartedly agree with those commentators that it is indeed a disgrace for a town to attempt to exploit its own history for its profit and prosperity. Therefore, it infuriated me to see Stratford doing exactly the same thing in this way with Shakespeare as Roswell has done with UFOs. How dare you! <sighs> in order to reach an amicable solution, I would like to make the following request. Nay, demand. Nay, insistence. All establishments in Stratford-upon-Avon using the name, quote, William Shakespeare, unquote, or, quote, Shakespeare, unquote, must be immediately closed. All shops and hotels must surrender their licenses. All future theatre shows and other similar festivals must be cancelled. After a cooling off period, they may be reopened under new franchises, but on no account must they in any way, shape or form make any reference to William Shakespeare. All merchandise in the Stratford-upon-Avon retail sphere relating to William Shakespeare must be immediately recalled from sale. Failure to comply with my insistence will result in me being forced to write to the Queen, to the Prime Minister, to the President of the United States and the Secretary General of the United Nations with a petition stating that, for the sake of good taste and public decency, 
Stratford upon Avon must be twinned forever in infamy and degradation with Roswell, New Mexico. Yours sincerely, Ben Emlyn Jones. Will my letter get a reply? I doubt it. No, those people in Stratford are too busy getting fat off the Shakespeare thing, aren't they? Milking the Shakespeare gravy train, aren't you? <laughs> you disgust me. You completely and utterly disgust me. How dare you? From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups. This is Planet X. Phew, right. It's okay, I've calmed down a bit now. And I think I am in a fit state to talk, um, you know, rationally and respectfully about the space weather this week. We have a waxing crescent moon rising 12.23pm, setting 9.35pm, so it's not up for very long at the moment. Sunrise 6.36am, sunset 7.28pm, so uh, it, is, it is getting into autumn now, and the weather outside of the non-space variety does seem to indicate such. Um, believe it or not, there's almost no sunspots. We've got two, two tiny little ones. Um, so we might be looking at a spotless day very soon. That's weird because we're supposed to be in the solar maximum now. Um, spotless day zero, but we'll see what happens next week. And of course we have a very quiet sun too, even though, as I said, we're in the solar max. In fact, in the last week, <coughs> it's hardly risen above the sea line. The, the actual x-ray trace is almost flat. We've had a few blips here and there. But um, nothing at all. I mean, will this affect the geomags? We shall. Well, oddly enough, um, the forecast is actually still quite high. We have a 30% chance in the middle latitudes of activity, 10% chance of a minor storm, 1% chance of a severe storm. Now, in the high latitudes, there's a 15% chance of activity, 30% <coughs> chance of a minor storm, and 40% chance of a severe storm. That's quite unusual. Um, it proves that, you know, the the geomagnetic storm forecast is not directly related to solar activity it must have another cause um i think Mangia samantha lawton will be interested in this because apparently um there have been some gamma ray bursts from the cloud tops now this is very very interesting there's some there's some mystery associated with lightning whenever there's a lightning strike something strange happens there's another even bigger lightning strike that goes up into the sky. It's called a sprite, and these can be enormously powerful, many times the force of a nuclear explosion, shooting up into space. Um, mi billions and billions of, of megawatts of electricity. It's really, really quite remarkable. Now, where this comes from, nobody knows, but there's, all, there's an awful lot, um, awful lot of interesting, interesting research going on there, like, uh, like Mangia Samantha Lawton is doing about what this actually is. I think I'll have to go into that in more detail in a future show. Well, near-Earth asteroids. Well, um, on September the 10th, we had um, 1,424 potentially hazard asteroids in the region. Um, so things have brightened up, I must say, because this, this week's chart is full of pink liners and even one or two red liners. Now, as I explained, a pink liner is any... Um, it's, it's basically any asteroid that is closer than five lunar distances. And um, red liners is any asteroid that's closer than one lunar distance. So when you get a red liner, it means that the moon, temporarily, is not the closest natural object to the Earth. There's something in between. Now, uh, what we had on Friday and Friday la last week was 2013 RO30 and RO32. Now, these came, um, what was it? Um, very, very close indeed. 0.8 and 0.4 lunar distances respectfully. So 2013 RO32 was less than half the distance to the moon. Now, um, one of them was 26 and a quarter feet across and the other one was 29 and a half feet across. So they were pretty small really, just big boulders. Now, uh, there was a 70 foot across one called 20, 2013 QE16 which is 8.2 lunar distances away. So that's a lot, lot further. In fact, that's over 2 million miles. Um, also on Friday, we got 2013 RQ5, and that was uh, 4.8 lunar distances. Now, that's a lot bigger. That's 89 feet across. And we've got some even bigger ones, a mile plus in size, but they're not coming through till November. There's very, very little on the chart for October at the moment. So uh, well, keep me, I'll keep you posted if anything comes up next week. Solar wind speed, 211.8 miles per second. But get this, density, 126.203 particles per cubic inch. 
And that's five times its usual limit. So, you know, space weather is not always com connected to solar activity in terms of um, in terms of, so of solar wind and flares and, and geomagnetic storms and things like that. Not flares, um, the uh, geomagnetic storms I meant. Um, so that is this week's space weather. Anything, a lot of things that happen up there affect what happens down here. That's worth remembering, isn't it? This is Planet X. Planet X. Well, thank you very much for um, listening to this week's Ben Emlyn Jones Show on Planet X Radio Live. This is the fifth programme that I have done, and um, I must say I'm really enjoying them, and I'm really, really pleased that m you guys out there like it as well. There's plenty more coming. Anything new that catches my eye, gets my goat, you'll be the first to know on the Ben Emlyn Jones Show. If you have any questions for me or anything you want to... Um, you want to sort of ask to do please get in touch via the planet x radio um email they'll be happy to forward any um inf anything um, you want to any suggestions you might have as well for any subjects you want me to cover and um well it's an awful lot coming up i know because um in a couple of weeks is the exopolitics expo the fifth british annual exopolitics expo expo and um, that, I'm very, that's on the 28th of this month. And I'm, I'm sure if you listen to the other shows on Planet X Live, you will hear, have heard more about that because um, we have been discussing it. And what's more, many, 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 many of us will be there at that show. A lot of other people from Planet X are going down there. And so am I. So I do hope to see you there. It will be really, really good. We've got um, Richard Dolan. We've got Andrew Johnson. We've got Marcus Allen, Anthony Beckett, and... Uh, Professor Chandra Wickramasinghe. Now he's very interesting because um, and he's been interviewed on Planet X as well on the main show because um, he's he has a fascinating idea, panspermia, which is this idea that life can travel through space by natural means, organic material can travel through space by natural means. And that is an incredible idea, isn't it? And it means that life here and life on Mars and life, life everywhere else might actually be related. <laughs> that'll be a turn up for the books so please if you see me do come over and say hello we'd love to meet you there anyway so thank you for listening to this week's ben emlyn jones show on planet x radio stay tuned because there's more coming up next on this on this on um this uh, live stream and don't forget i'll be back next wednesday 8 p.m enjoy your evening bye bye Welcome. Welcome to the Ben Emlyn Jones Show on Planet X Radio. Tune in for all the latest news, views and reviews from the world of government cover-ups, ghosts, UFOs, hospital porters, paranormal investigation, hidden knowledge, forbidden history and archaeology, chemtrails and more hospital porters. The date is Wednesday, the 11th of September and the time is 8pm. I am Jeff Rents without the hair. I am Art Bell without the cigarette. Stay where you're sitting and do not touch your dials. The Ben Emlyn Joe Show is coming, ready or not. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups, this is Planet X. Available, started a fire and weakened the structure. And the structure called the building to, um, well, people say collapse. I say pulverise, turn to dust. As uh, Dr. Judy Wood has explained, it, she doesn't think it was explosive. Other, other people have explained this as explosive, explosives. One thing's for certain, though. It wasn't the planes hitting the building in fire. Let's not forget that. I'm sure most people listening to this program understand that. That same day, another object, it may be an aircraft, maybe a missile, I've not made my mind up yet, struck the Pentagon. Whatever it was, it caused an enormous amount of damage, killed a large number of people. And um, again, there was some pretty horrific damage there. It was all blamed, of course, on uh, a CIA agent called Osama bin Laden. And uh, we had to go get him, go into Afghanistan and get him. Of course, they didn't get him because he was dead already. Um, or at least, yeah, he actually, uh, he was, I don't think he was, he was in Egypt at the time, I believe, and he died there. 
Uh, but he was dying when uh, they sent in the, the, the troops who were already there. In, they were actually in Oman on exercises or somewhere in that region. And um, strangely enough, although they were on desert exercises, they packed a warm winter jackets and white snowsuits. Hmm. That'll come in handy in the burning deserts of Arabia, won't they? Yeah. And, um, well, suddenly enough, people have forgotten about Bin Laden now. Well, they, they forgot about him soon after. And, um, <clears throat> and of course, uh, he, never, he, only, he never surfaced again until, apparently, he was killed about two years ago. For the third, about three times he was reported dead, actually. That's quite remarkable, isn't it? Anyway, um... I'm quite surprised looking through the news. There doesn't seem to be any mention of it. Well, this is program five of the Ben Emelyn Jones show on Planet X Live. And um, as you will probably have noticed at the beginning of this program just now, when I mentioned the date, it is indeed the 11th of September. It is 12 years ago to the day that um, two buildings collapsed in New York, or, or three buildings. Did I say two buildings? Oh, yes, there was a third one, wasn't there? Building 7, Building 7, what happened to Building 7? Um, yes, even I forgot that for a minute. Yeah, a third building collapsed, or, well, turned to dust, or in some way, it disassembled itself in whatever way, by whatever means, um, it apparently did. The uh, Salomon Brothers building, World Trade Center 5, also collapsed, even though it had not been hit by any aircraft. The two buildings that had been hit by aircraft collapsed, apparently due to the fact that the uh, jet fuel in the planes, although uh, very little of it was was actually. This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. Do not be afraid. We are now in control of what you hear. One, two, three, testing. A journey to the far reaches of knowledge and the unknown. I can't believe I just saw that. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups. One soul and preeminent power. From extraterrestrials to exposing the truth. I'll try to explain as much as I can. You're listening to Planet X. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X. This is the Planet X Network, and stay tuned for the Ben Emlyn Jones Show. It's coming up next.